In 2000, the director of security at Tesco's located in Bournemouth, UK, received a concerning call. A newsagent had found a letter left on top of the shop's photocopier. The letter demanded money from Tesco, otherwise their customers would be hurt or even killed after the author would send them bombs. The letter ordered the supermarket to place club cards in the Daily Echo, a local newspaper. These club cards would be altered so they were able to be used in an ATM machine with a pin decided on by the sender. When used, £1,000 could be withdrawn in a single transaction. If Tesco's failed to comply with the sender's demands, their customers would be subject to the explosive devices. There was no information that gave the police any clue as to the identity of the person who penned the letter. It was only signed, Sally. Later, local police received a fire damage letter similar to the one found by the newsagent, holding the same blackmail demand and threat as before. After making inquiries of Royal Mail, the police discovered a recently fire damaged post box located in Bradpole Road in Bournemouth. Did Sally try to destroy the letter after having second thoughts about sending it? A third letter followed soon after, upping the stakes of bomb threats and harming Tesco's customers. Sally claimed they would send small bombs they had made through the post to selected Tesco's customers. If their demands were not met, the bombs would get bigger. However, the police saw a flaw in Sally's plan. You can't withdraw £1,000 worth of notes from an ATM machine, it's just not physically possible due to the aperture. The police began an attempt to contact Sally to tell them of the flaw. They were making a demand that wouldn't be possible. Police ran a message to Sally in the Daily Echo, with a number to contact them on, in the personal ad section. But they heard nothing. The police created a task force revolving around the letters and their sender. Operation Hornbill consisted over 100 officers taken from each part of the Bournemouth police and was subject to strict secrecy. What was said within the task force stayed within the task force. They couldn't risk any information getting out, even to other officers who weren't working on the case. This is due to fears that Sally could potentially be an officer. In 1990, Rodney Wichelow was jailed after he attempted to extort and blackmail the food company Heinz. His threat, which he later undertook, consisted of placing broken glass and razor blades in baby food. The task force was stunned when they discovered him to be one of their own, a metropolitan police detective. The police weren't going to allow this kind of incident to happen again. By now, it was obvious that the sender, Sally, was a local resident. Sally had sent a letter to the local police with threats towards the local Tesco's and posted said letter in a local post box. Sally had also asked that the club cards be issued in the local newspaper. DSI Phil James called a meeting with some of his top colleagues. These individuals spanned from senior officers, the Kidnap and Extortion Unit and New Scotland Yard. They discussed what to do about the situation. Sally had sent threats but was yet to play out any of them. Was this individual bluffing and hoping to get what they wanted on fear alone? They were interrupted by a knock at the door. Reports of an incendiary bomb had come into the station. Police and the bomb squad rushed to the scene. The female who opened the letter luckily had only minor injuries. When officers located the device, they took it for further inspection. Now, I'm not going to explain how the device was made for obvious reasons. Let's just say this small device wasn't lethal in any case, but it seemed Sally was beginning to follow up on their threats. This caused understandable great concern within the task force and Tesco's. Police told Royal Mail to be on the lookout for any suspicious packages that matched the description of the one found. Within hours of being issued the warning, Royal Mail called in the three suspicious packages. Bomb Squad was called in and they were able to x-ray the three packages. All three did indeed contain the same small bomb device as the one already found. The Bomb Squad were able to disarm these and take a closer look at them, but the number didn't stop at three. Seven more packages were sent out to Tesco's customers, so were letters stating how the receiver had been followed home from their recent Tesco shop and targeted because of this reason. Sally threatened bigger, more deadlier devices. The police and Tesco's were working together to safeguard all of the Tesco customers. The police told Tesco they needed a fallback plan in case Sally does go ahead with their threats for bigger devices. At this point, although concerned, Tesco wasn't about to send out hundreds if not thousands of altered club cards to the local newspaper to be used as Sally required. Police still didn't know if this Sally was working alone or part of a larger group. Would it be only one person using the cards, or would a number of people do so? What was to stop Sally making a public statement about these cards and once they were issued, disclosing the pin to everyone else? Tesco's could lose millions in a single day. The police logged all the locations of where the bombs were received and found an area of focus. 
A mile square area was focused on, an area which was around the newsagents where the first letter was found and the post box that had been set alight. Police considered anyone within that area a suspect. They placed the post box under surveillance as they strongly believed it would be their best bet of catching Sally, or at least note a number of suspects who used the post box, then follow them up. Their plan was similar to that of the one which aided in catching the Mardi Gras bomber. In the mid-1990s, a similar blackmail and extortion threats were made towards Barclays Bank and Sainsbury's. Edgar Pierce was caught after he was placed under surveillance. Police hoped the outcome would be the same for their case before it was too late. In mid-October, Tesco's received a letter from Sally. They were tired of the stalling and hesitation and told about the next generation of bomb they had been working on. They were making a pipe bomb and would place it in the garden of a local Tesco's customer. This one would be more deadly than the last, with the ability to definitely injure or kill. Sally also sent a three-page cipher code police were to use to contact them via the Daily Echo. DSI James contacted the editor of the Daily Echo and they met in private. He explained to Neil Butterworth the entire investigation and how they needed to somehow get the code into the paper without creating any suspicion. This would prove to be difficult as the editor couldn't tell anyone why the bizarre code was in the newspaper, it was decided it would be used as a word search and puzzles. Just like the suspicion that Sally could be a member of the police, there was also a possibility they could be working within the team of the Daily Echo as that was the targeted newspaper. Police got word from Royal Mail. They had been able to find the location of where Sally's latest letter was sent from. Just as suspected, it was the post box that had been set alight. Sally, for some reason, was using the same post box. They looked at the undercover footage taken from the surveillance of the post box, but the image was too dark to be of any use. Police were able to reach Sally with the coded message placed in the Daily Echo. They asked if Sally would agree to a money drop rather than the club card distribution as they were unable to complete the request. Sally saw through this. They stated they knew Tesco and the police were capable of doing as they had demanded and saw this as nothing more but more stalling. Three weeks later, Sally sent another letter. They stated the police and Tesco's had until Saturday the 12th of December to comply with the demands and place the altered club cards in the Daily Echo. They also referred to an A to Z map of Bournemouth. They stated in less than a month the pipe bomb mentioned before would be activated. Tesco's had no choice. They began producing thousands of cash cards. They came up with an idea. What if these cards had a limited number of usage, meaning after X amount were used to withdraw cash, the others would cease to work? Would this be possible? Sally used the same post box, so would they use the same ATM? It could be a final way to catch Sally if indeed it did go this far. But Tesco wouldn't be able to create the amount of cards requested by the deadline Sally had set. One week before the deadline given by Sally, Sally gave a reference of where they had placed the pipe bomb using the A to Z spoken about earlier. This area was placed in lockdown. Over 500 houses in the Ferndown area could be in danger. Gardens, bushes, trees, everything was searched. Nothing was found on the first day, but on the second day. A loud noise emanated from the search area. Thankfully, it turned out to be a couple of kids exploding hydrogen balloons in a local garage. The search continued. On the third day of the search, Sally wrote a letter stating there was no pipe bomb, but if police and Tesco stalled any more, then the threat would be undertaken. Again, the letter was posted in Bradpar Road, but Sally wasn't the only one using the letterbox that day. It was the run-up to Christmas, and many letters were sent. From that postbox alone, 172 letters were posted by 38 people. Sally had to be one of them. Police weren't allowed to open any of the posted letters due to Royal Mail rules, so they noted down the addresses of all of them received from the postbox. They contacted the recipients and pretended to be Royal Mail, telling them there was an issue with the local post and needed to know if they knew who the sender of the letters were so they could talk to them. Soon, officers were able to make some positive identifications of the posters who used the Bradpole Road post box. One of those identified was a local police officer. However, after hours of interrogation, he was let go. He wasn't there, Sally. He was eliminated along with a few other suspects. The deadline came and went, with no bomb threats carried out, and by the 17th of February, the number of suspects dropped to just one. This individual was seen with a plastic petrol can he had just filled up. 
The police contacted the petrol station and were able to receive not only CCTV footage of the man, but his information from a check he had paid with. 50-year-old Robert Edward Dyer was placed under surveillance. Police visited Dyer in his home in order to investigate him and eliminate him. Whilst two officers questioned Dyer in the living room, another located a desktop and ran a specialised programme. This programme would search the computer for keywords such as Sally, Bomb and others pertaining to the investigation. If any of these words were found, it would open the document they were found in. The programme was successful and found a letter created by Sally. Dyer was their Sally. During further investigation of his home, officers found the original coded notes created by Sally and sent to police. It was in Dyer's handwriting. 24 hours after Dyer's arrest, police were able to intercept a letter from Sally. It was an exact match to the one they found on Dyer's computer earlier. What I can't understand at the moment is you can't remember sitting at the computer drafting this letter. I don't understand it either, but, but that is the case. You might not understand why you did it, but I think you remember doing it. No. Dyer had set up his shed to create bombs, and the name Sally, well, Dyer once had a dog named Sally. On the 4th of May 2001, Robert Edward Dyer pled guilty to nine counts of blackmail and one count of common assault. He was sentenced to 16 years in prison, later reduced to 12 on appeal. He was released in 2007.